Good morning. Thank you for attending our webinar this morning on Tips for Teachers, Bullying Prevention and Intervention. My name is Kathy Espinoza, and I will be your moderator and host this morning, and I am the AVP of Ergonomics and Safety here at Keenan & Associates. We are very proud to have Dr. Marlene Schneider, who is an associate professor at the Institute of Family and Neighborhood Life at Clemson University in South Carolina. Here she serves as the Director of Marketing for the Olveus Bullying Prevention Program. Dr. Snyder is well known nationally and internationally as a conference speaker, trainer, and technical assistance consultant. She consults regularly with a wide variety of professional and community organizations on a range of topics related to bullying prevention and intervention. She's also written extensively on the topic of ADHD, including a book entitled ADHD and Driving, a guide for parents of teens with ADHD. Dr. Snyder is the founding member of the International Bullying Prevention Association. So with that, I'm going to pass over control over to Dr. Snyder, and she will go ahead and take over from here. Um, good morning, uh, Kathy, and welcome to all of you who have uh, joined us. Thank you very much. But I want to, first of all, thank uh, Hazelden Publishing and Keenan and & Associates and you, Kathy, for making this uh, webinar possible and for rescuing us here with the slide advancement. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with all of you, and we're going to dive right in. Um, I am very appreciative of those of you who are teaching and taking your time to join us. I want to remind you that bullying prevention does fit in with other safe school climate initiatives, including PBIS, RTI, character education, and social emotional learning. I have the Maslow's hierarchy of needs here, and I think it's good for us just to sit back and reflect that really all of these programs are there to help children. As we know, they have basic physiological needs that have to be met, food, clothing, clothing and shelter. But the second need is safety needs, and that's where bullying prevention really comes in, is letting kids feel safe and welcome in their school environment. And then we also know that they have to feel welcome, that they have to feel loved, and that they feel be that they belong before they can move on to truly settling in and learning and academic achievement. Mental health and physical health is certainly all uh, wrapped up in bullying prevention and safe school climates. Next slide, please. I think it's good to take a look at the definition of bullying. All of us have seen this probably over and over again, but. I will tell you that there is a difference between different um, interpretations or bullying prevention programming. We are taking a look at using our definition as that when someone is repeatedly or on purpose harmed in some way, where people do mean or hurtful things to another person who has a hard time defending him or herself. We do look at the three components of this, is that it's intentional harm doing, that it is done over time, and that it is um, an imbalance of power. If you advance the next slide, please. Um, we really make it clear that bullying is like other forms of abuse. This is peer abuse. It is not to be confused with conflict. Um, it is intentional harm doing, it's repetitive, and an imbalance of power. So we really need to all be on the same page as far as the adults to understand the devastation that can come to children who are being harmed by bullying behavior. Next slide. In the Olvius Bullying Prevention Program, which we are the most um, well-tuned into, and in other programs, you're going to see us put a big emphasis on all of the children in the school. Many times when people are looking for bullying prevention programming, they're looking for something to help the child who is being bullied or the one who is being harmed, and that's the person in the H position here. 
We also know that bullying prevention is very, very important for those kids who are harming others. And in the cost-benefit analysis that was just released at the International Bullying Prevention Association, they are showing that really the the long-term costs are almost double for not helping children who have harmed others in the long run through their lifetime. So it's very important that we're taking a look at the kids who are starting the harm and hurting others, taking a look at at how they have power over a small group of people here in the A, B, and C position that will help um, to hurt others. And then we have disengaged onlookers in the E position and then our defenders in the F and G. We do not ever use the term bully or victim as much as we can, especially when we're talking to children and about children. We find that these labels are counterproductive and that even though it takes a little longer, we talk about those who have bullied others and those who are bullying others. Because frankly, what we know about kids is that they will cycle in and out of these various roles within just a few hours' time. For an example, someone can be harming someone in a social, certain social context with a certain group of kids and then later in the same day be defending some of their friends. So kids are trying on different roles, and what we need to do is to let them know that really the majority of kids are not involved in bullying. In terms of social norming, we know that most kids are not dealing with this. And in our research, we're showing about 30 to 35 percent of the kids being in the roles of bully, bullying others or being harmed by others or both. But the vast majority of students are silent bystanders and that we can help them learn appropriate behaviors that can help um, make a better climate in our school. Next slide, please. We know that bullying behavior in schools very often gets mixed up with not only conflict resolution, conflict um, in schools, but we do know that schools do need to sort out what is bullying and what is physical assault. We also know that some bullying that uses sexual names or sexual innuendos are truly sexual harassment or dating abuse or domestic violence situations. We know that as kids grow up, if they are allowed to um, harm others and humiliate and intimidate others into relinquishing funds for safety, that that winds up being extortion over time. And, of course, rumors and lies um, as kids get into their adulthood, this actually can be defamation of character. What we're trying to point out here is that as kids are little, we sometimes put these into bullying behaviors. But as kids age and get older, these behaviors really can move into criminal offending. So they don't magically appear, disappear as kids get older. And that during the time that they are in school is really the time that we have Uh, to change this behavior. The next slide also shows us some of the other things that sometimes schools mislabel as bullying. Uh, Certainly um, kids being harmed or taunted because of their race, or religion, or sexual orientation. These are all civil rights violations and need to be treated uh, as such. If kids who are in wheelchairs are being harassed and perhaps um, their wheelchairs, we've seen some unfortunate situations where kids have been shoved into walls or their um, pathways have been blocked. This is truly disability harassment and does have other legal venues for taking care of this kind of thing. Cyberbullying has become a a topic of late, and what we know is that as kids age out into 18, that there are different things that will come back to haunt them. Um, For example, in sexting, those young people who are in high school who are passing on um, uh, images of their classmates and so forth, that um, they can be charged in many states and wind up um, having to uh, register as sex offenders. So these 
Um, Problems can be very serious and they can have lifelong consequences. So we need to be making kids in our schools, our students, aware that once they are involved in these things, that we really can see some very serious consequences long term. Next slide. We're going to just quickly um, remind you of the impact of being targeted, being bullied. We know that over time that you will see uh, the, the children who are being victimized having lower self-esteem, not only during the years of their schools but on into adulthood. We see higher rates of depression and anxiety. We know that very often children will opt not to come to school when they are afraid. They will have psych, uh, so, somatic illnesses, stomach aches, headaches, bedwetting, um, tough time sleeping, bringing on physical illness as well as mental illness. And we also see that if this is unaddressed, that these children are much more likely to have suicide ideation and attempts than other kids who are not being bullied. Next slide. The health consequences of bullying have been well documented in researchers' um, work around the world. This one is coming from Finland in 2004. We have just understood that Dr. George Thrabenstein from Georgetown University um, has replicated this, and he indicates that the findings are very similar. Taking a look on the left-hand side, these are the children who are being bullied, and the right-hand column is exemplary of children who have not been bullied, take a look at the um, almost three times higher rate of headache, um, twice the problem with sleep problems, abdominal pain about twice. Um, but the big one that you'll want to pay attention to is the depression scale. The strong indication is truly clinical depression in children. And what we know about those children who are being bullied is that they are eight times more likely to suffer clinical depression than children who are not being bullied. Next slide. We know that this link to depression is what can predict the suicide ideation and attempts. Um, we have been quite concerned with the media um, coverage that after an unfortunate suicide of a youth, that they come out with headlines that say bully side or um, suicide because of bullying. And we need to back up here for just a minute and understand that the number one predictor of suicide ideation attempts and completion is the presence of depression. We know that in the United States about 18% of our children report being bullied. And thankfully, the suicide rate is not a direct correlation or we would expect 18% of our children attempting or completing suicide. So please, as you're looking at media, understand that the connection between this is the existence of depression. There is a strong association between involvement in bullying and depression in suicide ideation and attempts among those kids who are both bullying others and those who are being harmed by others. So it's not just those children who are being bullied um, who have problems with suicide, but those kids who are harming others as well. So there is a lot more to learn, and we just want to make sure that teachers um, don't just jump from the idea that bullying causes suicide. Next slide. Um, there we go. What we have here is um, a study that was done by Buss and colleagues. This was done in Nebraska and Iowa where they matched children who were going into kindergarten for abilities. They watched them all the way through fifth grade. And what they saw is that when there was exclusion in kindergartners where children were saying, you can't play in the sand pile with us, 
you can't swing with us, you can't join our group, or you can't play with us, that those were the very same children that had been rejected that would be called names and be excluded in the early elementary grades. What they saw is that by the time these kids got into second, third, and fourth grade, that there was decreases in classroom participation, which meant these kids were not feeling comfortable to raise their hand and volunteer answers. They were not of the kind that would um, join easily into a group when a teacher would say, pick a partner. Um, But by the time these kids were in fifth grade, they did see that there was a statistically significant decrease between those who were being excluded and those who were not in terms of academic achievement. They went on to say that exclusion is very damaging to a child's academic um, abilities and that we do need to pay more attention to being excluded. And I would mention to you that there are really a couple ways you can look at exclusion. One is not being invited to birthday parties, not being able to play with groups on the playground as easily as others. But there is even a more devastating kind of exclusion, and that is where these children are almost invisible to their peers, that they have been excluded for so long that they are not even thought of as being as a part of the group. So we really do need to pay attention to that and find ways to let kids know that they belong um, and that they are a part of the group and that we want them to be enjoying their school um, experience as well. Next slide. This is just a a little summary of what we know about kids who will um, bully others and that is that bullying um, may be a part of a conduct-disordered behavior pattern. Uh, For those of you who have schools that are using the positive behavior intervention support system as well as a a bullying prevention program, these will be the kids that will be needing Tier 2 and Tier 3 interventions. We know that these patterns don't magically disappear when kids graduate from high school, but that you will see bullying behavior in the workplace and as adults. So it's important for us to get to these students and help them change their behaviors and not abuse their power. Many of these kids are leaders, and if we can get to them early, we can change that trajectory of using their leadership to hurt others to learning how to support and to lead uh, effectively. Dr. Olveas did do a research study in Norway with just boys where he found that those boys who were identified in middle school and followed until they were 24 years old, that they were four times more likely to have three or more, and in our country, felony convictions um, than those children who had not harmed others during their elementary and middle school careers. Next slide. The impact on the bystanders, we know that many of the kids who are watching bullying situations have become um, noticed that they are suffering from some symptoms of post-traumatic stress if the situation is bad enough. We know that they feel afraid, that they can feel really powerless, Um, They feel guilty for not acting, especially if the person who is being harmed is a friend of theirs. We see, unfortunately, that when bullying is allowed to happen, that they begin to look at the victim or the person who is being bullied as an object, that they don't really have any feelings or that they deserve it. Um, But I think one of the most important things that bystanders begin to see, especially if a teacher is in view, is what the teachers are doing, and they begin to feel that either the teachers don't care or that they cannot keep them safe if they stand by and watch uh, the adults not respond. Next slide. The effects of bullying on the school climate, you can read this list here, but basically it, it boils down to that students don't feel safe They are worried more about being um, in harm's way than they are about learning. 
there are lots of different research um, um, protocols out there that have actually shown that girls especially um, are much more worried about being bullied than they are about their classes and that, um, again, students begin to perceive a lack of control or caring on the part of the adults in their systems. Next slide. Bullying prevention and intervention, as I've outlined here, really is for everybody. And I'll include us as teachers and administrators and adults in the system. When a system is toxic, we know that this spills over also into adult relationships. So we're making a calmer and a more safe and welcoming workplace for the children as well as the adults. It's interesting to note that in Sweden, they actually, in their law, look at the school as the workplace for children. So it makes it important. These um, next slides that I'm going to show you are from our database of over a half million children. And here's what you can take away from these briefly. Um, we know that the younger you are, the more likely you are to experience having been harmed. You'll see here that girls are slightly more likely to be bullied than boys through the sixth grade. Then you see a difference in gender where the boys are more likely to be bullied than girls the rest of their school careers. Next slide. We see just the opposite stair-stepping where the um, bullying of others becomes uh, higher as you get older. It peaks in the eighth grade for the girls, peaks in the twelfth grade for boys, and we didn't realize until we had this data that bullying behavior continues through high school. We had always thought that as kids got older that they let that behavior drop out. And now that we know, we have empirical evidence that shows that it continues at a high rate for boys and slacks off some for girls, but that kids are uh, harming other kids uh, throughout their high school years. Next slide. When we ask how they were being bullied, I think that it's interesting to take a look that there's really not a whole lot of difference between boys and girls except um, in the physical area. And depending upon your location and the situation in the school, sometimes we actually see girls um, bullying more than boys. Keep in mind that these are national data from a half million U.S. students from over 1,200 different schools. Um, it's nice to know this national data, but what's really important is that you should know what's going on in your particular school building and know where you fall within um, those uh, averages. What we see here is that verbal bullying and rumors and sexual uh, harassment are big problems for our schools. Those are the top three. We see exclusion only being slightly higher for the girls than the boys. Uh, so we caution you to really think in terms of do you need separate bullying prevention programs for girls and boys because boys really are uh, experiencing relational aggression as well as the girls. Take a look here at how often kids are being cyberbullied as compared to the other kinds of bullying. And this is where we would encourage you to think in terms of a bullying prevention program for your schools that covers both traditional bullying and cyberbullying at the same time, but not having to have two separate programs. Cyberbullying is only about 6% of um, the problems that we are seeing in terms of bullying in the schools. Next slide. And where is the bullying occurring? It's very important for schools to know where this is happening. Kids will report to you. It does make a difference in terms of gender, um, but it does give you a, a starting point in your blueprints for bullying prevention to know that if the hallways or the playgrounds are the places that are highest reported for both boys and girls, 
that it's good to take a look at your supervision system, making sure that the adults who are supervising those areas during breaks have been trained to recognize bullying and to know how to stop it and how to report it so that it does not continue. Next slide. I, I, I want to go back to that. There's one more thing that I think is really important. What we know is that in elementary school, the highest place that kids are going to report being bullied is on the playgrounds. In the middle school, we're taking a look more at the athletic um, locker rooms, bathrooms, and um, also outside on the athletic fields. But in high school, we have been extremely surprised that usually the first place of the highest incidence of bullying being reported is in the classroom with the teacher present. That points a need uh, for some perhaps um, better understanding of what bullying looks like, what it sounds like, and how we can intervene on the spot right while we're trying to teach. So it's... Um, I thought that was something that it, you might be interested in hearing, that there is difference um, between middle school, elementary, and high school in terms of where bullying is most likely to happen. Next one. In knowing what to do, it's always good to know what not to do. We're all looking for something that's quick and easy um, because we know that we want to address this. We all care about our kids. But we know that short-term solutions like school assemblies very often just create an awareness, but they aren't going to do anything long term. We also know that it's not productive for a school to just jump from one program to another or one focus to another. Um, we also know that those kids who are harming others, sometimes schools think that they can put them together and have group counseling. We have found this to be like um, bullying university. They support each other. They help each other learn more and better ways to harm others. So that is not a recommended practice. We also don't put children who have been victimized together for group training. Uh, those kids really need individual one-on-one -on -one attention and help. And we have found that those groups very often when they were held were targeted even more by those who were harming others as they saw them as likely targets. We also know that suspension and zero tolerance policies for bullying behavior are counterproductive and are not recommended. And victim, uh, victim offender mediation and conflict resolution are wonderful programs when you're dealing with conflict, but keep in mind bullying is not conflict. It is abuse, and we do not use those tools to address bullying. They're wonderful for conflict, but not for bullying. These are the core principles of the OVS program. We do want to put the responsibility for bullying prevention squarely in the uh, administrative and adult realm. Um, we want our adults to approach this, all students, with warmth and positive interest. Um, it is important that kids know where the limits are in terms of the way they treat each other, that we consistently use non-physical, non-hostile, negative consequences. Again, negative consequences that are logical, not punishments when rules are broken. And that the adults in the schools really do have to function as authorities and positive role models. Children are watching us. And if we use bullying behaviors to work in our classrooms in terms of behavior management, they see it and they will replicate what they see. So we have to be very careful as adults that we are, are doing always the right thing, and it's, it's not easy. Next one. We really have uh, taken a look at this bullying circle, and you'll see that the heading has changed, and again, bringing back to the fact that children are watching us in our behavior. And if we stand by and hear terrible names um, being called, if we watch horrible things happening to kids and we don't step in, children see us as either not caring, that we're disengaged, or if we are giggling or laughing along, they see us as actually being part of that bullying group and cause a lot of mistrust. We need to be sure that children are always seeing teachers as defenders, 
that they are there to keep us safe and to keep us uh, involved in the school going on. Next slide. This is the overview of the OVS bullying prevention components. Just to give you a quick idea, there are things that have to be done at the school level, the classroom level, individual level, and community level, and always involving the parents or the guardians of the children if we are to make a long-term impact on the problem of bullying. Every adult um, has a responsibility here. And as we get into the classroom um, interventions, all of the students in the school are involved in bringing bullying to an end. Next slide. This is a list of the things that are done in the um, uh, school level. Uh, we do ask that teachers become involved as representatives in their bullying prevention coordinating committee. We know that teachers will be asked to conduct uh, surveys within their classroom so that they know exactly how much bullying is going on, where it's happening, and how they can um, help. Um, we ask the school to determine to have school rules. Um, we ask teachers to help with the supervis supervision of the students during the times they are together and that we have um, an involvement of parents that teachers are going to be helping with as well. So let's move on to the next slide that gives you a basic overview. These are the basic rules that we use against bullying, and they fit quite nicely. If your school has a PBIS program, usually PBIS says we will respect others, or respect is an important um, rule and we just put these as sub-rules under that rule about respect. The rules are we will not bully others, and some people have said, well, we can't use this with PBIS because it's a negative rule. Uh, we would ask you to take a second look at it. We think it's stated positively. We are not going to hurt other people. We will not bully others. We will help students who are being bullied. We will include students who are being left out. And when we know that someone is being bullied, we'll tell an adult at home and an adult at school. This is the reason that you want to have parent information and parent training available before you start your bullying prevention program so that parents know exactly what to do and how to ask for help and how they can partner with the schools to help bring bullying to an end. Next slide. This is an example in our next slide of what a kickoff or a launch program may look like in a school. Next slide. We have found that the children really do uh, enjoy these programs. They can be taught songs and um, have uh, entertainment and raps. Um, but these kids really do um, get into the rules. They want to talk about the way they treat each other at school. Next slide. The rules um, that I just showed you, uh, this is a way that one school determined that they would put these on their playground. They actually put them at, on the end of a, a building um, with visual cues as to what these rules really meant, and it's been very, very helpful to them. Just an idea you might want to try in your school. Next slide. For the problem of being uh, left out, this is a school in Africa that spoke Afrikaans, and this is the rule about we will try to include others. Children are told that if you find yourself on the playground without someone to play with, come over here and other kids can come over and join you, or it is the responsibility of other kids to come and invite you to play with them. One very easy thing that can be done and has been quite um, effective there. Next slide. The classroom level components. These are the things that we really ask the teachers to do. Um, this is posting and enforcing the school-wide rules against bullying. We ask for regular class meetings. In a class meeting, we actually ask teachers to circle the children so that they can look into each other's eyes and build community. 
you know, groups of kids are just groups of kids who are assigned to your classroom. But when you have a community, that's when people who are assigned to you really begin to care about each other. So the teacher's role is to help build community constantly, not just during class meeting time, but at all times, giving the kids the message that the way we treat each other is truly important. And then we also ask that you get to know the children's parents. We know that in some areas that is easier than in others, but it has been key in having good communications with parents um, before, during, and after um, any time that you have to work with a bullying situation. Next slide. These are the things that can be taught in those class um, meetings, not only about the bullying circle, what bullying is, what it's not, but how you can actually help children know what to do. Um, first of all, on the line of courage here, we have borrowed this from um, the Freeds and Freeds, and it has been very effective. Just teaching kids not to join in on the bullying um, is not taking a lot of courage. It's not high risk. But as kids get older and feel more comfortable in their situations, they can move on over to the point where at many of the kids in these programs, after they've been there a while, do feel comfortable in confronting those who are doing the bullying and can help um, very much um, calm down the classroom and the school. Next slide. We also have class meetings that matter resources, um, both in cyberbullying and traditional bullying, and these um, materials are available for grades K through 12. Next slide. We have done some research in states, and the one in Virginia, um, you can read this slide. I'm not going to go through these, but basically what we know is if you do bullying prevention only, no other interventions, that you can increase academic uh, standard achievement scores. So that's really good news with all the focus on academic achievement. Next slide. In the individual area, this is where when kids are being supervised uh, appropriately, we know that the rate of bullying behaviors goes down, but that bullying is still going to happen from time to time. And we need to be sure that all of our teachers have the skills and the ability to stop, to step in and to stop it, to be able to speak with the students who are being bullied and those who are bullying others, and if need be, with their parents so that you feel confident that you can um, do this. And we also need to develop individual, individual intervention plans for those kids who we lovingly refer to as our frequent flyers kids that need a little bit more support and a little bit more help. So that is provided in that individual level component. Next slide. Here is a basic tip for teachers. When someone comes to you and tells you that, you are, that they are being bullied, these are the things that we ask teachers not to do. Um, it's easy to say, well, I saw what you did and, you know, that's, what you get, or you tell them, oh, don't tattle. You shouldn't tattle. We need to really be careful to listen. Um, we don't tell a child ever to ignore the bullying, just as we would not tell a domestic violence um, person who has been harmed just to ignore the harm that has been done to them. We don't tell the child to retaliate, even though they may get this message at home and we need to work with parents to educate them as to what they should not be telling the child to do as well. We don't expect kids to work this out alone. We, what we have learned over the years is that if children can stop bullying entirely, they would have done it long ago. We also don't bring kids together and demand apologies because most of the time they are very insincere and the things that are said very often make the child who is harmed feel even worse. 
Um, you can bring them together for restorative justice after the fact if the chi- children want to meet together to make amends. Um, we allow medi- don't allow mediation or conflict resolution in these situations, but restorative justice um, is effective. Next um, slides. Again, it's important not to confuse bullying with conflict. I think that we have talked about this, but the messages that we need to give to a child is, who has been harmed is that no one deserves to be bullied. We need to have a safety plan in place that they feel comfortable, that they can um, get help when they need it. We also need to give the person who is doing the bullying um, the clear message that their behavior is inappropriate and that it must change and that we work with them to change that behavior. Next slide. As we listen to parents, we have to be very um, aware that they can be our best partners. And we start working with them early and that they are part of the coordinating committee, that they have a special training for parents. Um, We constantly are sending out materials as to how parents can help and what they can do. Um, Teachers very often will have special class meetings with parents to um, let them get to see other children and how they can work together. And then also we work with the um, parents individually as their children are either involved as a child who is being harmed or one who is harming others. Next slide. This is a a slide that um, is really quite um, instructive for teachers and for parents. What we know is that those kids who are being bullied will very often tell their friends or siblings first. They will tell parents first, um, but teachers are sometimes the last to know about the harm that is being done to a child. So we really encourage teachers that if parents come to you saying the child is being bullied, that the parents probably know um, sooner than you will know. We find just the opposite to be true of a child who is bullying others, and that is that you as teachers are much better at knowing who is harming others, and we see parents very often being in the dark about their harm, the harm that their children are um, doing. So we need to be careful that um, as we work with parents that we Uh, are able to understand where they are coming in terms of understanding the problems and work with them so that they are working with us rather than working against us. The other tip for teachers, as I mentioned before, is that we try very, very hard never to use the label of bully or victim. Um, One way for sure that um, a parent conference will not go well is if we start it by saying, your child is a bully. We will start by saying, I'm very concerned because your child has been using bullying behaviors. They've been making some bad choices, and we want to help them correct that behavior so that it doesn't um, go down the wrong path. Their parents are very, very willing to work along, and the parent education piece is really important before you start a bullying prevention program. Next slide. So we have a lot of different tips. I've hit on several of these um, as we have gone along. I know that um, when when I was teaching that um, one of the reasons that I went into teaching, and I would suspect it's the same for all of you, is that you love kids and you love the idea of being able to teach them skills that are going to be used for a lifetime. We care about kids. We really do. But I also know that as you get busy with the lesson plans and working with kids, that very often we forget to tell them how much we care about them. 
and that if something is happening to them that's making them uncomfortable, we need to verbalize that invitation to come to us, to tell us what's happening, and that we will work with them the best we can to make them feel welcome and that they belong in their schools. At the school-wide intervention level, what we want teachers to do is to be sure that you know and are able to follow the district's anti-bullying policy, which should be um, really clearly synced with your state laws. You do need to know your individual school's reporting requirements and communication protocols. We have to provide information to parents about bullying, and we have many of these fact sheets that you can just um, photocopy and give during parent-teacher conferences as needed. Some of our schools can put things on their websites, but the more education you can do for parents about the importance of keeping kids safe before the fact and during the school year, the better off you will be. We also really want to encourage students to, or teachers to continue to recognize those students who are doing the right thing, giving them praise, a pat on the back, just a, a quick um, pulling them aside and saying, I saw how you included so-and-so or I saw how you defended so-and-so, thank you, um, does a whole lot more than having to do the consequences for bad behavior. But when you do see it, we want teachers to take immediate action when they observe it and consistently use the non-physical, non-hostile, logical consequences when the rules are broken. Um, it's not punishment, but we are helping children to correct and um, do better with their behavior. Next slide. In the classroom interventions, again, what we ask teachers to do is that you have classroom uh, rules about the way we treat each other and you discuss those on a regular basis. You need to have positive expectations that they will not be bullying and let them know that most kids don't, that this is not a normal behavior, that bullying really is um, destructive and um, something that you don't want to see. Class meetings can be held um, once a week or depending upon the maturity level of kids. What we recommend is that for little ones, 10 to 15 minutes once a week where they have an opportunity to circle and build community, talking not only about bullying, but what does it take to be a good friend? Um, what do friends like to do together? What are some of the things that we can do to build better teamwork within our, our group here? Um, lots and lots of things that can be discussed. Elementary, 10 to, 10 to 20 minutes uh, once a week, depending upon the age and attention span of the kids. Middle school, moving up to about 40 minutes per week. And in high school, we go to once every two weeks, taking a full class period. Many of the schools say we can't afford to do that, and what we have found is that really schools cannot afford the time that it takes to work through all the problem behaviors. Um, that once class meeting in high school every two weeks, that you can set your buzzer or your alarm system for your, your classes to change, and shorten each class period by about seven minutes, giving you an extra period in the day. Um, school administrators need to be firmly behind um, working with class meetings in schools. It used to be that we told teachers to find the time to circle up the kids, and basically um, teachers were so busy working on making sure the kids were ready for the test that um, it was easy not to be able to find the time. And when you have a specific time at the, the week and everyone has a class meeting together, we find that teachers have enjoyed it. They have learned more about their students and their families and have really been able to help not only with bullying behaviors but other needs that children have. Um, the next one is um, using videos and discussions and connecting the way we treat each other to curriculum. 
it's important to support messages that the way that we treat each other is important. And if you can just take care of your own classroom where the dynamics between kids is respectful and calm, you can go a long way toward um, helping these kids. And if it's a school-wide effort where every teacher is doing the same thing, it won't be long before you actually can feel the respect and um, the difference in a school climate. Next slide. This one is on the individual interventions, and again, we had talked about this before. We have to listen carefully and work quickly and effectively using research-based methods um, to help um, bring bullying behavior to an end. We do want you to take a look at your state laws. Some of the state laws now are requiring that parents of all involved students are notified when a bullying situation happens. Um, but we do think that it's important not only for schools to call those kids who are harming others, but also to allow students, parents, to know when they are being targeted or being bullied. Very important um, for our, our parents to be informed so that they can work with us. We need to refer the students affected by bullying to additional help, such as counseling or mental health staff, as needed. There are, frankly, bullying situations that are so severe that teachers are not going to be able to, to take care of it by themselves. And you should not hesitate to reach out for help. And for those who are in PBIS schools, a referral to Tier 2 or 3 for safety or behavioral plans, or if special education is part of that mix, Putting it into their IEPs or their 504 plans is also another option for teachers to get additional help. Next uh, slide. We'll just remind you that um, if you'll click again, please, um, Kathy, you're going to have a series of clicks here. We know that it takes a long time for schools to decide which program or how they're going to move forward. This is called the initiation period. The next click, please, Kathy, is the implementation period. And what we know about a bullying prevention program that is really long term and that is going to be systemic, stopping bullying for the long run, a systems change program, that implementation phase is going to take about one and a half years. And then if you'll click again, you'll see that the institutionalization, basically when you get a program down so that when someone reports to you that they uh, suspect bullying, that everyone in the school knows exactly what to do, who to contact, how to do it, how to work with the child who is being bullied, how to work with the child who is bullying, and their parents will take you sometimes three to five years. But we hope that you get to the point where you're not thinking about a separate bullying prevention program, but that all of your efforts to come together, and this is just the way we do things here. You have to be patient and understand that it does not happen overnight, that um, working toward this is a very um, worthwhile goal, and that schools who are really ready and have good leadership in their schools can actually implement and get a lot of this done within one year. But this is generally how long the educational change process takes. And as you see, this uh, concept is taken from Michael Fullen. Next slide. So I don't want teachers to get discouraged at all. And I want you to also recognize the fact that it is teachers who are doing this work in the trenches day after day after day. And what we know is that educational change is really based on what teachers think and do. And as Michael Fallen says, it's as simple and as complex as that. We hope to provide support to teachers, um, giving you opportunities to learn these skills, um, but it takes a systems change program with each 
uh, of those four components, the school-wide, the classroom, individual, and community coming together. And we do know that we can reduce bullying. We have research from hundreds of schools across the United States. Each school has their own data. Each school serves as its own um, control because each school is so different um, in terms of the makeup of the leadership, the teachers, the students, and the parents, that we don't have to compare you against other schools, but just keep improving your own school from year to year. It does require a team effort. Um, We know that in those schools where a teacher gets all excited and they want to do something and none of the other teachers do, they may improve their classroom, but we want to encourage you to do it as a school-wide effort because your children are going to be in contact with other kids on the school grounds. So it, it just makes sense to do it building by building rather than grade by grade. It takes a long-term commitment, and one of the first places that you may want to go to for getting a commitment is taking a really good survey of all the kids in your schools, getting your your data for your particular building can really get the buy-in that you need, get people excited about it, but we also want you to understand that it is going to take a long-term effort. This is not just a one-day event or a one-week campaign, but this what it really takes to keep kids safe is a long-term systems change program that uses the best information that we have from research that can bring all of the stakeholders together, all pointed toward the same goal of keeping kids safe and belonging. If you want more information about this, you have a website here. You can also call um, Hazelden Publishing. When you go to Violence Prevention Works, if you go down to the left-hand side and click on Bullying, you will find all of the information about the Bullying Prevention Program. You'll also see in the center here where it says, Is your school ready to address bullying? There is a readiness assessment there, and it will put you through the steps that um, help you to be prepared and ready to have your staff trained, ready to make that commitment. And the time that you spend with that assessment in getting ready is um, really very, very helpful. Um, The people at Hazelden are very willing to help walk you through that as well. And I want to thank you again, Kathy, for the opportunity to explain what it is that we do and what are some of the most important tips for for teachers, and we hope that you have found this to be helpful. It's been extremely helpful, Marlene. And as a parent raising a house full of future teachers, um, just the tremendous resources that you give specific teachers, positive actions that they can take is tremendous. I do want to remind everybody viewing the webinar that Keenan has designed a school safety center on the PNC Bridge. And Oveas has been kind enough to be part of this and has allowed many of their resources and information about their programs to be posted on here. On the PNC Bridge, you'll notice that we've got a section that covers bullying, cyberbullying, sample classroom curriculum. We've also got some grant funding assistance and templates that Oveas has provided to us that make it easy to apply for grant funding to help with your bullying prevention program. Anybody out there that would like to have access to this, uh, just email me or your account manager and we can get you pulled up onto the school safety program. Down at the very bottom of that list on your left, we've got parent resources. And this is parent night assistance. It is verbiage for your newsletters. Um, Most important, in December, we have got two principal and counselor webinars that we are offering, 30 minutes that go over this site, because we can actually give access to PNC Bridge to each one of your principals, so they don't have to do the work. We have looked through 200 programs out there on bullying, 
which is why we have asked Oveus to be such a strong portion of this because we believe in Oveus. But these are coming and you should be receiving an invite. So again, if you need access to this site or information on the webinars, you are more than welcome to email me, Kathy Espinoza at Keenan.com, and I'd be happy to help you with all of that. All right, um, as we are running just about a minute over, I'm going to go ahead and close this off for today. Marlene, thank you so much for all your fabulous information and taking the time to help us with our bullying issues here in the state of California. Kathy, it's been a pleasure, and I will mention to you that we do have OVS schools in California that we would offer to anyone who would want to visit or to get more information from as well. And so please keep in touch, and thank you for this opportunity to visit with your teachers. You guys and gals are all amazing people, and the work that you do makes such a difference for kids. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much, Marlene, and thank you all for joining us. Take care.